All right, Matt, what's good? Everything's good, man. It's, uh, it's a big night. Yeah, so this is the opening of a brand new Chic store. Yeah, this is a brand new opening of our first ever Legacy of the Door. Uh, okay. You actually have a long history in the sneaker business. You started out with Nike originally. So what year did you join Nike? I joined Nike in 2002. Okay. September 2002. What was your original job at Nike? I was an Egan. I was, I was an Egan in, uh, in LA. Oh, what does that mean exactly? Uh, Egan is basically, it's Nike spelled backwards. Oh, okay. Uh, it's sort of an entry level tech rep. You do a lot of product education, marketing support, and you basically educate um, retail sales associates how to sell Nike product. Okay, so you start at the very, very bottom, pretty much. Okay, so, but during the time of Nike, you actually built your way up. Okay, so you went, I remember, the, I looked at your LinkedIn page, it was like you went from, you know, this position to like this rep, to this area rep, to all that, like how did you move up so quickly? Uh, a little bit of luck, um, a lot of networking. Uh, I would say, especially at Nike, Nike's a matrix organization, so there's no real set career path. Uh, the biggest thing is really finding people that believe in you. Okay. And, uh, when you have the support and you, and you work hard, Success follows. So okay. that was my, my path. Like, how high did you get up before you decided to leave? I was um, a director level, uh, so I oversaw the sports wear business, which is basically for everyone out there. It's, it's all the lifestyle stuff, the cool stuff that everyone sort of gravitates towards. I, I managed a specific channel in the sports wear product. Okay, but last year you made a big move from Nike to Chic Shoes. And what is your title as Chic? President. You are the president of Chic Shoes. And how many stores are in the chain? Uh, just about 140 today. Wow. So you went from a director position at Nike to the president of a 140 chain retail monster. Now, was that a hard choice? Going from you know Nike, which is the biggest footwear maker on the planet, to you know to managing a smaller company, basically? It was in some aspects, but you know, my background in college, I was an entrepreneur major in college, okay. um, and I don't consider myself a classic entrepreneur, I always wanted to build a business on my own, um, but I always saw myself at some point um, having the opportunity to uh, find a, a smaller company and take it to the next level. So this was actually something I had thought about prior to leaving, uh, and was once I sort of became comfortable with Sheik the man and Sheik the company, uh, it was an easy decision. Despite the allure of the brand that is Nike and, and all the things that come with that, uh, it, it became an easy decision once I saw the opportunity and the person behind it. A lot of people, a lot of sneakerheads, have a dream of possibly opening up their own sneaker store. You know what I'm saying? Like you're out collecting Jordans and you think one day I'm going to turn this hobby into an actual business. But you're actually managing 140 stores. So what is really the biggest obstacle to owning a sneaker store initially? Getting into a new is actually getting distribution. Yeah. Especially since you know Nike and Jordan are pretty dominant yeah. in the business. And uh, they're not looking for a lot of new distribution. Yeah. And so it's super challenging for someone to come in to get Nike and Jordan lines in the store or to get you know specific uh, stuff with Yeezys, Adidas, uh, yeah. uh, Puma lines that are super exclusive. Everyone talks about exclusivity. They're not trying to open up distribution on those lines. So to be able to open up a store and be successful um, without those products uh, is very, very challenging. And if you really want to be successful and you want to be in this industry, you have to expect that, that might be the path, yeah. uh, first and foremost, because you got to build your reputation to be able to earn those types of products. And I'd say that you know, if, if, if you're not prepared to really get after it and work the business, um, it's a very challenging business to be in. Okay, because from what I understand, I have friends who own you know, individual stores, and what Nike does, from what I heard, is like, oh, you want the retros? You gotta buy all this other crap that no one wants. <laughs> <laughs> and stock all the Team Jordans and everything else like that. Keep selling those and then we might throw you a few retros. It's more really about, for them, I mean, and just speaking of so my old brand hat, uh, representing a line or a brand holistically. Uh, it's easy to sell retros every weekend, but really the challenge is, and, and for any brand, you want to be able to sell the breadth of your line. You want consumers to know everything you have to offer. Yeah. And um, that's the harsh reality of trying to run a store, is, is how to sell the other things, how to do business Monday through Friday. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, uh, but it's, it's really, that's how the business is run, that's how the industry works. Yeah. Um, that's how Chic has managed to take this from one to 140 stores. You don't get here by uh, living on retros, because there's, you know, cycles and everything ebbs and flows. Yeah. It's not always going to be a Saturday business. Do you think that Nike ultimately wants to control everything, doesn't really want 
places like Chic to be around because they want to control the retail and the online and the everything. Because for example, I heard it's very, very difficult to even sell Jordans online, even if you have an account. I don't think that's the goal. Um, I think there's a lot of, I think most brands realize there's an inherent value um, to having a balance and different perspectives uh, in, the, in the marketplace, in the retail marketplace. If you look at all the different types of channels, sporting goods, um, you know, specialty retail such as us, uh, athletic specialty like Foot Locker, um, each of those footprints in the marketplace gives you a different voice. And as a brand like Nike, you have to operate so many different types of retail, not just operate retail alone, to be able to reach consumers the way all those different channels of retail reach consumers. So I, I think that they realize that there's a value to having retail partners, uh, and that, that long term, that's the, the success is to have a blend of your own retail to be able to do multiple expressions, as well as having partners to be able to express different now, now you mentioned Foot Locker. Now Foot Locker owns a bunch of other brands. Foot Locker, they, open, they have Champs, they have East Bay, they have foot action. So you kind of have this big monster that Chic Shoes is you know, competing with. 140 shoes, 140 stores is very impressive, but the Foot Locker conglomerate is what? A thousand something? Yeah, a thousand plus. So how is it that Chic really compares with a monster like Foot Locker? I think we each have our own distinct lane. Um, for us, really, it's about our ability to connect with consumers. When you get to a certain size, it just become, you, you become more formulaic. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, really, it's about connecting in the neighborhoods in which we operate, being inclusive, and, and really giving our customers a VIP experience. Mm -hmm. um, most of the customers, if they're the peak customers, we know their names, um, and we, we try to make them feel special when they walk in the door. And as, as again, as you get bigger, it's harder and harder to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but at our current size, I think we're successful in doing that. And the formula for us, uh, for the foreseeable future, is, is to remain community relevant and really be local uh, and, and grassroots. Gotcha. Now. I know a lot of retailers are worried because Nike is so dominant in their brand that they re they rely so much on one on one particular brand. You know what I'm saying? With so much of their sales, which just becomes kind of like a dangerous kind of situation because once that brand starts to change their mind and raise prices or change distribution, you're screwed because it's one brand that you're you know so focused on. Is that is that a, a real concern of what you do? I mean, I think when you look at the business, you want to have. Uh, portfolio that can support those types of changes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a real concern. I mean, that's the reality of the business is that if someone all of a sudden pulled distribution from your brand such as Nike, uh, you'd have to find a way to make up a significant chunk of your business. Um, but you know, I guess for us, we really focus on creating, and what we're trying to do right now with our current efforts is create the Chic brand and create sort of the mindset for the consumer that when you walk in a Chic door, you're going to find a multitude of products that fit your lifestyle, whether it be Nike or Jordan or anything else. We, we recently brought in Beats headphones. Um, if you are of the mindset, if you're interested in the intersection of fashion, sport culture, um, lifestyle, street culture, uh, we've got products for you. What, regardless of brand, we should be your destination. Okay. You know, you know I mean, the retail business is, is changing a lot. A lot of it is going online. You know, I mean, when we were kids, you, you, People were scared to put in their credit card online, but now this is the accepted way of, of buying things. You see companies like Amazon that are putting retail businesses out of business. So as a retail focused business, because it doesn't seem like online really is a huge part of Chic yet. So, so what I'm saying is, where do you, as the president of the company, how do you see surviving in a changing industry like this in the future? Well, I think the biggest reason that um, the internet has provided, I mean, obviously technology, cons our consumers, young consumers, they adopt technology, but it's really about the experience. They're gravitating towards an experience. They don't necessarily care about the back end of the technology that makes it function. Um, as a retailer, I mean, I always think that, that brick and mortar retail will have a place in the marketplace. I don't think that, there are tactile consumers out there that want to look and feel and touch things. Yeah. Um, it's really about striking the right balance. And it's also about providing an experience that brings people to the brick and mortar realm. It's if, if what consumers are telling you when they go to Amazon is that the experience of where they're buying that particular product isn't the experience they want, and Amazon is. So if you can, if we can swing the pendulum and create that balance um, between people still walking in the door as well as clicking, uh, I think that's the perfect scenario for us long term. But I, it's, I don't think that it's ever going to be one or the other. I think we've got a, a world of dealing with this both. Well, because you know, I, I own a lot of Nike stock and. I read the reports and the online is, is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger piece. But if you look at the percent, it's totally still minuscule. Oh really? Most of it still happens when people walking in and buying it. 
Okay. What else is the future for Sheik? The future for Sheik, honestly, is uh, very bright, first and foremost. Um, you know, I think for us, it's really about, you know, we are really focused on who our consumer is. Um, I think over the past couple of years, we may not have been uh, expressing that the right way um, in the form of our retail footprints. And you mentioned the internet, which we don't necessarily feel like we've got a big presence there yet. Yeah. I think really it's about amplifying our voice and re-educating consumers about who we are and what we do. Because I think at the, at the core of it, we're hyper-focused on those consumers. And when we execute and do it well, I think we just have to create and re-establish the connection that we've always had and really expose ourselves to a broader range of consumers. Um, we've traditionally been very, very narrow in the focus, mm -hmm. but uh, for us, it's about broadening the lens and really getting, being inclusive and letting everybody experience what it is we offer to the marketplace. Sure. The resale, you know, um, it's, it's changed because a lot of kids are getting into it. Like, I'll give you a prime example with those red, uh, red Octobers. You know, 250 retail, I believe, that they shipped at Nike. The blanks, I have two pairs of. Yeah. I have this pair that I actually traded for, it was worn like twice. But yeah, what, um, what was that? Um, the other trade? Yeah, what was the trade? 